Welcome to Weekly News Highlights, where we wrap up your week with a glimpse back into what went on in the past week. I'm Kim Dami in Seoul. The G7 summit hosted by this year's Japanese G7 presidency is taking place in Hiroshima this weekend. The member states as well as President Yoon seok yeol will discuss global issues and demonstrate their commitment to uphold the international order based on the rule of law. South Korea is launching the country's homegrown spacecraft Nuri next week. The third launch will be its first ever mission with real satellites on board. Another climate crisis warning this week, this time from the World Meteorological Administration. The Earth will likely warm up by 1.5 degrees Celsius within the next half a decade. Back on Wednesday, South Korea and Canada celebrated 60 years of diplomatic ties with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's visit to Seoul. His trip here completes a reciprocal visit to each other countries as President Yoon seok visited Canada last September. Let's turn to our top office correspondent, Kim do -yeon. South Korea and Canada vowed to expand cooperation on key areas as President Yoon seok hosted his Canadian counterpart Justin Trudeau for a summit on Wednesday. This is centered around five key areas global order, security, economy and innovation, climate change, and culture. Security especially took a major step forward. The two also penned a Memorandum of Understanding on Exchanges for Key Natural Resources and Minerals. According to the joint statement, this MOU will further cooperation towards strengthening and securing supply chains for clean energy and critical minerals. This could be due to South Korea's strength in battery and automobile production and Canada's abundant natural resources. For Canadians, it'll mean more investment, more trade, and more research and development in our country. Together, it'll mean benefiting our workers to develop clean and reliable solutions like next generation electric vehicles to power our net zero future. Another agreement was for the younger generations as there will be more working holiday visas available for Koreans. President Yoon has always put South Korea's relationship with Canada as one of his priorities for diplomacy. In fact, they met multiple times in the past year of Yoon's term. And last September, Canada was the first country that President Yoon visited solely for a bilateral meeting when the two's relationship upgraded to a comprehensive strategic partnership. And this visit completes the exchange of visits between the two countries as they celebrate the 60th anniversary of the diplomatic ties. Yoon touched upon the long history as well. This and with the growing uncertainties around the globe, including the war in Ukraine, they vow to work together. But even as we celebrate that past, we must allow ourselves to be inspired and strengthened by the resolve shown in the past because we are facing uh, times of incredible challenge and complexity right now and into the future. In the meantime, this summit kicks off President Yoon's busy week of diplomacy as he goes to Hiroshima to attend the G7 summit. This will be followed by visits from the German Chancellor as well as EU leaders next week. Kim Doya, Arirang News.
After marking first year in office, President Yoon Seok-yeol continues to take part in diplomatic exchanges, including meetings with the leaders of the U.S. and Japan, followed by summits with Germany and the European Union. For this edition of Weekly Focus, we have our foreign affairs correspondent, Pei Eun-ji, to guide us through the key events this week. Welcome, Eun-ji. Thanks for having me. So, as we just saw, our Kim do yeon reported on the 60th anniversary of diplomatic ties between South Korea and Canada. Now, what other key events can we look back on, Eun-ji? On Tuesday, President Yoon also sat down for talks with Ukrainian First Lady Olena Zelenska, who visited Seoul as an envoy for Kyiv. She requested more non-lethal aid from Seoul, while President Yoon offered sympathy for the war-torn nation. Yoon also vowed to actively support Ukraine through close cooperation with NATO countries and the international community. Right, celebrating the 60th anniversary of diplomatic ties with Canada by sitting down with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and also a meeting with the Ukrainian envoy, Ms. Zelenska, right? Now, for details on that, let's turn to our top office correspondent, Oh Soo-young, for more. Sure, let's take a look. President Yoon Seok-yeol has expressed South Korea's solidarity and continued support for the people of Ukraine in his meeting with Ukrainian First Lady Olena Zelenska, who has requested more non-lethal aid from Seoul. Presidential spokesperson Lee Dong told reporters that the South Korean leader and his wife Kim Gonyi on Tuesday met with Zelenska, who is currently in the country as a special envoy for her husband Volodymyr Zelensky. During their meeting, Yoon conveyed the South Korean public and government sympathy for Ukrainians and the families of those afflicted in Russia's invasion of their country. <laughs> The president also commended Zelenska's prominent role on raising global awareness and support for her war-torn country. According to spokesperson Lee, the Ukrainian envoy did not request lethal weapons from Seoul. Expressing Kyiv's gratitude for South Korea's solidarity and humanitarian aid, she requested more non-lethal military equipment, including those for mine detection and removal and rescue vehicles. She further asked that many South Korean firms participate in Ukraine's reconstruction efforts. Yun replied that Seoul will actively support Ukraine through close cooperation with NATO countries and the international community. Over the nearly 15 months of war in Ukraine, Seoul has maintained the policy of providing non-lethal aid to Kyiv. But President Yun told U.S. media last month that he may have to reconsider Seoul's mode of support if Russia commits large-scale crimes against civilians or other violations of international law of war. In a Yonab interview published Tuesday, the Ukrainian First Lady said Yun's words were wise and she was grateful for his understanding. She also thanked Koreans for setting a good example and encouraging Ukrainians, deeming South Korea a model for recovery and growth. Zelenska further expressed willingness to invite President Yoon and First Lady Kim to Ukraine, saying the country is always waiting for its friends, though Yoon's office later said a formal invitation wasn't made. The top office says First Lady Kim also agreed to Zelenska in a separate welcoming session, noting her Ukrainian counterpart's campaigns for children's education and mental health support during war, and reflecting on how South Korea, also as a nation afflicted by invasion in modern history, deeply emphasizes with the people of Ukraine. Oh Soo-young, Arirang News. Now, President Yoon seok yeol is in the Japanese city of Hiroshima at the moment to take part in the Hiroshima G7 summit. Now, what is he up to there? All right, President Yoon is taking part in the summit as a leader of an invited country, making him the fourth South Korean leader to attend a G7 summit. There, he's set to speak at an expanded session of the multilateral forum. On the sidelines of the event, a trilateral summit between South Korea, U.S. and Japan is expected to take place for the first time in six months. Yoon will likely sit down for talks with U.S. President Joe Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida on Sunday. Also on Sunday, he'll be holding a separate bilateral meeting with Kishida. Together, they'll visit a memorial dedicated to victims of the 1945 atomic bombing of Hiroshima, where the monument in memory of the Korean victims is located. They'll pay tribute as agreed upon during their summit two weeks ago. Seoul's presidential office explained that this will be the first time the two countries' leaders will have visited the memorial together and that no South Korean president has visited this memorial before. 
Since taking office in May, the UN administration has been especially focused on strengthening relations with Washington and Tokyo. The last time UN and Biden met was just three weeks ago, when UN made a state visit to the U.S. last month. And it's been only two weeks since UN and Kishida met after holding a bilateral summit in Seoul earlier this month. Right, what an eventful May for Seoul and Tokyo. That's right. And that's not it. When President Yoon suk comes back to Seoul on Sunday, he's scheduled to sit down for a summit with Germany and the European Union, right? That's right. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz will visit South Korea on Sunday for a summit with President Yoon after attending the G7 summit in Japan. This is the first time in 13 years for a German leader to visit South Korea. Marking the 140th anniversary of the two countries' diplomatic relations, the two leaders will likely discuss ways to strengthen ties and fields, including supply chains and security issues on the Korean Peninsula. Before the summit, Scholz will visit the demilitarized zone that separates the two Koreas. This year also marks the 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations between South Korea and the EU. The European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and the European Council President Charles Michel will visit Seoul after taking part in the G7 summit. They're expected to discuss ways to boost cooperation on a wide range of issues like security, climate change, trade and the war in Ukraine. It will mark President Yoon's first talks with EU leaders since he took office last May. Right, it was a whirlwind week of diplomacy and more to come over the weekend. That's right. President Yu really seems to be focusing on diplomacy starting off his second year in office. Right. Let's keep an eye on that. Thank you for the wrap-up, NG. My pleasure. This week, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un reappeared in the public eye for the first time in a month. He reportedly visited the National Aerospace Development Administration, home to the regime's first-ever military reconnaissance satellite. Now there, he checked the final stage of preparation and gave an OK to future plans. And again, he brought his daughter Juwe with him, which an expert says is a way of highlighting that his diplomatic moves and decisions are inevitable decisions for future generations. The North has been saying since April that it is ready to launch its very first military satellite. Then, when will Pyongyang carry out the anticipated plan? Well, while the final call will be up in the air, rather in the hands of the leader Kim Jong-un, an expert says it takes about four to six weeks to carry the satellite and prepare for the official launch. He says the North may aim for specific or special occasions for the launch. There will be joint military drills between South Korea and the U.S. There's also Victory Day to be celebrated in July. It's sending both internal and external messages that the North can bear and get through the pressure from the international community, especially from the U.S. based on the regime's solid military power. Skepticism still lingers surrounding the quality of images the North can get from that spy satellite. Considering the regime has a limited access to advanced parts and components due to economic sanctions slapped on it by the international community. Still, the launch of such a satellite could function as a way of showing off its military abilities. And in the meantime, the North appears to be preparing for a possible military parade. Based on the latest satellite imagery taken by Planet Labs over the weekend, around 50 to 100 vehicles were spotted in an open space at the Bidim Parade training ground in Pyongyang. Now, that's where the North parks vehicles and holds rehearsals ahead of military parades. No details like the number of personnel or other equipment were detected. Normally, though, it takes around two months to prepare for a military parade. Just like launching a spy satellite, the North could carry out a parade on its 70th Victory Day on July 27th. In fact, the North has staged military parades in 1993 and 2013, marking the 40th and 60th Victory Days, respectively. North Korea has announced that it will celebrate the Victory Day in a grand scale since the beginning of the year. So these are signs that the North is preparing for a large-scale military parade. And South Korean military authorities say they are keeping close tabs on the regime following the North's major political events.
On the first and second launches, the Nuri rocket carried payloads, mainly designed for verifying the performance of the launch vehicle. This time, the rocket will be carrying eight satellites, including the next generation small satellites, which each have their own missions. Next Wednesday, South Korea will take another significant step for its space industry with the third launch of its homegrown space rocket, Nuri. This time, Nuri will have eight actual satellites on board rather than dummy satellites. Let's turn to our Choi soo Hyung for the details. South Korea's aerospace history will be rewritten on May 24th. The Nuri space rocket's third launch is completely different from the two previous ones. The first and second launches in October 2021 and June 2022 were test launches with dummies, but this time it's the first operational launch carrying eight actual satellites. So, which satellites will be on board? First, the largest and heaviest main payload satellites, next generation small satellites the second, made by KAIST, will be placed at the front of the third stage of Nuri. It has a main camera with a resolution of 5 meters, an observation width of 40 kilometers, and weighs 150 kilograms to help it explore 600 to 800 kilometers of mission altitude ranges. It uses an imaging radar that is not affected by light or clouds, day and night, or even severe weather conditions. NextSat the second is primarily a satellite that captures radar images. It is a synthetic satellite that sends radar waves and detects the return waves to create composite images. It differs from the optical camera images and has differences in performance compared to the existing Arirang-5 satellite due to its scale. Four Doyasat, named after small but fast birds, developed by the Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute, will also be on board. It is also known as SNIPE, small-scale magnetospheric and ionospheric plasma experiment, the world's very first will four satellites fly in formation to observe space weather. Four nanosatellites, Karam, Dare, Tasol and Laon, about 10 kilograms each, will provide real-time transmission of fine space plasma distribution, Earth's magnetic field, solar wind and space storms at a mission altitude of 500 kilometers. In this third launch, the achievements of Korean satellite manufacturing companies are noticeable. The space radiation detector by Lumir, the optical payload by Justac, and the polarimetric camera by Cairo Space will perform their respective missions. In particular, Cairo Space's Cube satellites will come back to Earth automatically without space debris after the mission is complete. These eight satellites will be a milestone for Korea as a space powerhouse, venturing into space with the country's cutting-edge technology. Che Soo-hyung, Arirang News. The world is likely to reach a key climate threshold for the first time within the next five years, warming up by 1.5 degrees Celsius. That is the latest warning from the World Meteorological Administration pointing to heat-trapping pollution and a looming El Nino weather pattern later this year. It's, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a conclusion that, uh, that, uh, that we haven't been able to, uh, to limit the warming so far and uh, and we are still moving in the wrong, wrong direction. Experts remain optimistic, though, saying there is still time to slow global warming by limiting carbon emissions. Still, the WMO predicts a 98% chance that one of the next five years will be the hottest on record, and any attempt to improve the situation must be done now before it's too late. In fact, we felt the warmer temperatures here this week. It's only mid-May, yet it felt like a hot summer across the globe, apparently. Our Song Yu-jin explains why. 
It seems the fight against summer heat has already started in South Korea. On Tuesday, daytime high temperatures in parts of the country hit 30 degrees Celsius or higher, exceeding their highest temperatures so far this year. So here in the capital Seoul, temperatures hit 30 degrees Celsius, which is about 7 degrees higher than the average temperature for this time of the year. I can definitely feel that the weather is much warmer this month when compared to the past. Based on my 84 years of life, May used to be cool or sometimes even quite chilly. I sweat like crazy when I'm outside. The weather is scorching both inside and out, so I hope our school turns on the air conditioner soon. Besides Seoul, the cities of Gangneung, Gwangju and Gyeongju recorded 35, 32 and 34 degrees Celsius each. These temperatures are normally seen during the midsummer month of July. The Korea Meteorological Administration says this is due to hot and humid air from the south and migratory anticyclones heating up the ground. But the fundamental cause? Global warming. This is not the first time temperatures have surpassed 30 degrees Celsius in May. If we compare Earth to a big pot, the pot has been slowly heating up over the past years due to global warming without us recognizing it. And we're feeling that change now through these high temperatures. These extreme temperatures are being seen elsewhere in the world too, such as in the U.S., Canada, Europe and Southeast Asia. Countries like Thailand, Vietnam and Myanmar have already seen several days where temperatures exceeded 40 degrees Celsius. Global warming is one of the causes of this exotic weather, and there are several studies saying temperatures in the northern hemisphere have risen due to higher sea temperatures this year caused by the El Niño phenomenon. El Niño is when waters in the Pacific Ocean become much warmer than usual, causing heat waves and strong storms, and ultimately higher temperatures. Song Yujin, Arirang News. And on Monday morning, South Korea's east coast woke up to a magnitude of 4.5 earthquake. That was the largest quake reported this year, and this is a particularly worrisome because the region has been reporting several smaller magnitude quakes. Our Lee Sin Jae has more. The magnitude 4.5 earthquake reported in the East Sea on Monday morning was the largest quake reported in South Korea this year. It's also the largest of the 16 total seismic activities reported in the region in 2023. Monday's earthquake was felt in most parts of Gangwon-do province and even in some parts of Gyeongsangbuk-do, Gyeonggi-do, and Chungcheongbuk-do provinces. And due to the frequent seismic activity reported in the area, the earthquake warning level rose from attention to caution. As of April, 13 earthquakes of magnitude 2 or higher have occurred in the area, within 5 kilometers of the epicenter of Monday's quake. Those include a 3.5 magnitude earthquake on April 25th and one of 3.1 magnitude this past Sunday. Also, a 4.2 magnitude earthquake in 1996 and a 4.3 magnitude earthquake occurred in 2019 in the area close to the epicenter of this recent earthquake. While experts say they can't pinpoint the exact fault zone yet, given that a series of earthquakes have occurred in the same region, the possibility of a larger earthquake cannot be ruled out. They're also trying to figure out the fault zone based on the range of earthquakes being reported in nearby areas. Experts are also concerned that more earthquakes are taking place in a shorter period of time. They added that while more analysis is needed, earthquakes with magnitude 4 or higher may be all originating from the same fault zone. With experts continuously monitoring the affected areas, and despite there being no damage reported on Monday, they say preparations for a larger earthquake are important, as the possibility of a 5.0 magnitude earthquake or higher remains. Lee seung Arirang News. That'll do it for us this weekend, but do stay tuned. Arirang News will be covering the Hiroshima G7 Summit throughout the weekend. Thanks for watching.